In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. For various reasons, modern man has doubted this star of Bethlehem, calling it a legend or folklore. And what is even more troubling is that when that kind of thing happens, then the occult adopts it as their own. Starts to make all kinds of strange ideas associated with the star. Now, some sincere and misguided folk using high power computers and programs have attempted to prove scientifically the star's existence. The star was really a natural occurrence or concurrence of retrograde motions of planets as well as they align up with various stars like Regulus. Now, whether intended or not, this is an attack. An attack on the scriptures and tradition. Now, please don't misunderstand me here. I am not saying this phenomena of the lining up of various planets with a star or whatever happened, didn't happen. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the real star of Bethlehem was miraculous. Cannot be proved scientifically. You need faith. It's something supernatural, causing wonder and awe. That's what miracles do. So God may have provided, according to nature, some faint glimmer of what was shown to those who had faith. So I'm not denying the technology's conclusion that there may have been an alignment of these planets and stars. But that's not the point of the scriptures, nor is it the point of tradition. This star was miraculous and it's undeniable. So today, let us reflect with the fathers and the doctors of the church on the miraculous star that led the three kings before recounting what they determine, keep in mind this simple truth. If what these modern thinkers say were true, that it was just really coming together of retrograde motion planets and whatnot, going through various little contortions from our point of view, and maybe a star back there, well, if that's true, then the fathers, the doctors, and the saints have misinterpreted the scriptures for 2,000 years. That's absurd. This is undermining the faith. This is an attack. This is an attack. So the breviary must be wrong too because it also says it's miraculous. So we've been praying the breviary wrong all these centuries. Now it reminds me of high school. I went to Catholic high school where they tried to explain away the Red Sea miracle with the Reed Sea miracle. All these millennia we got it wrong. <laughs> God really didn't part the waters. He just... Low tide. And the chariots got stuck in the mud when it rose back up to high tide and they all had to go home. Also, it is important to note that the fathers were very well aware of Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, and Venus, and all the planets, and various stars, and how they behaved. They weren't ignorant. The heavens had been mapped out quite accurately by Ptolemy, in the second century A.D. He may not have been able to see so deep into space as the Hubble Space Telescope and all that, but they had some things pretty well mapped out. Things that would line up as these scientists claim they would in the time of Christ. And really, that was the Bethlehem star. And also, let's not forget that St. Augustine was into astrology for a time. He knew all about these things. He put his mind around something, he got to know it. He's brilliant. One of the brightest lights that's ever shined in the world. He knew what he was talking about. He knew what he was seeing. So let's turn to Cornelius Alapid. He summarizes the findings of the fathers in the 16th and 17th centuries with his writings. Cornelius Alapid, he summarizes the findings of the fathers with the following conclusion, relying also on St. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologiae. He said, 
It was a new and unknown star, entirely different from other stars and did not belong to the heavenly system. In a word, it was miraculous. Thus, in the Roman breviary, Pope Leo the Great, Saint Leo the Great, he said, the miraculous celestial light. He explains, that is Cornelius Alapid, how this star was superior to them, stars in the heavens, in nine different ways, nine different prerogatives, it was superior. In fact, many fathers hold it to have been formed by the angels that it might seize the magi, the kings, with admiration for it, that they might perceive that it presaged something new and divine. Another reason for positing angels and some say even the Holy Ghost himself was the star, was the rational behavior of the star, okay? So it actually behaved like it was alive, able to turn and disappear at will and rest upon a house. Think how ridiculous it is to say that these planets and stars landed over a house. It doesn't work like that, folks. It's ridiculous. You have to do violence to the scriptures to make that work. The antiphon for the Magnificat at Second Vespers of Epiphany says the star is one of the three epiphany mysteries, along with the baptism of our Lord and Savior and the miracle at the wedding at Cana. Okay, a mystery is not natural. It's supernatural. Once again, I guess we've been praying this bravery all these centuries, and I guess that's just... Well, we were wrong, you know. We finally figured it out in the 20th century. What arrogance! So here are the nine prerogatives given to us by Cornelius Alapi from the fathers of the church in St. Thomas Aquinas. Number one, this star surpassed all others as to its creation or production. For the latter were produced in the fourth day of creation. They believed in creation in those days. It was produced in the fourth day of creation. But this one was produced at the time of Christ's nativity. It was produced later. St. Augustine taught, therefore, that it was a new star and was never seen either before or after this time. He said it was like the dove that God specially created at the baptism of our Lord as an outward sign of the Holy Ghost. Think about their theory. Oh, it's just this alignment. Well, that happens every now and then. It can happen again. Probably it's happened many times. This is new and special. Never been repeated. St. Augustine. Number two. It's superior to others by way of place. For other stars are in the firmament. But this one was in the atmosphere. It was before the kings in their journey to Judea and Jerusalem. And it came down to rest over the house where the Lord and his blessed mother dwelt. In other words, the cave. It came literally down. If memory serves, some of the fathers even held it literally went right into the baby Jesus. Wow, that's amazing. Number three, it's superior to others by way of its composition. Other stars are celestial in composition, as St. Paul says in the Corinthians, letter to the Corinthians. But in this one, it was aerial. In other words, it was not in outer space, as we talk today, but in the inner space, the atmosphere. Angels formed it out of atmospheric materials. Thus, artists, if you've ever looked at some of the pictures of the Epiphany, they have little angels flying up in the air, holding a star and hiding behind it. And they're showing what the fathers have taught. So, this star was made below the atmosphere to be down here and guide somebody. It's superior in its motion. Other stars have a circular motion. But this one went straight forward and took turns at times. It moved in a direct line as to guide the Magi to Bethlehem, changing directions as need be. Okay, you need to go to Jerusalem, so they're changing the direction. You go to Jerusalem, then it disappeared. Then it came back again. I guess they had a lot of smog in Jerusalem and couldn't find it. 
So the fathers go on. Number five, it's superior in time. Other stars shine only by night, for the sun's light obscures them during the day. This is also true even of the moon, which cannot easily be seen during the day. You have to work at it, which is the closest of the heavenly bodies. But this star, the star of Bethlehem, was bright by day as it was by night. It was superior, number six, in duration. For other stars shine perpetually. This one was temporary, for it continued only during the period of the wise men's journey. And once again, some say it actually terminated in Christ himself. It literally went right into him. Because he is the light of the world. Number seven, it's superior in size. The celestial stars are greater than the earth and the moon, but this was less than either. This, however, appeared greater because it was nearer the earth. Just as the moon appears larger than the fixed stars because it is nearer to us, although it is in reality far less than any of them. So it looked very bright, according to the fathers. Number eight, in being inconstant. For this star sometimes hid itself, as at Jerusalem. At other times it appeared and was the guide on their journey. When the Magi went forward, it went forward. When they rested, it rested. At length it stood over the house where the child was, and then, as though its work were accomplished in Christ's epiphany, it vanished the other stars have no such properties. Again, did the wise men have sextants? And they could triangulate and figure, okay, this is going there. I got that. I got that. I can find where the house is. That's what it would require to follow the scientific model they've given us. Does this make any sense? This is an attack on our faith. And finally, it is superior in splendor in which it surpassed all other stars. Hence, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who lived a little after our Lord in the first century. He died like 108. In the epistle to the Ephesians, he writes thus, The star shone so as to surpass in brightness all that were before it. For its light was indescribable. And its novelty struck with amazement all who beheld it. Its novelty, its newness, it's brand new. Never been seen before by all the astronomers heretofore. For the rest of the stars, together with the sun and the moon, were a kind of chorus for that star. For it surpassed them all in splendor. Thank you, St. Ignatius. Prudentius, in his hymn for Epiphany, used in the breviary, says, that star which surpasses the sun's orb in beauty and radiance. St. John Chrysostom says the same thing. Whence St. Leo the Great says, a star of new brilliance appeared in the eastern parts to the three magi. It was brighter and more beautiful than all the other stars. It attracted to it the eyes and minds of those who beheld it so that it was immediately perceived that this unusual sight was not without a purpose. St. Leo the Great. So the fathers compare it to the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day that led the Israelites to the desert. It was created for a specific purpose and ended when they had reached their goal, when the purpose was attained. We might also add that not everyone could see the star. Thus the confusion of Herod and many in Jerusalem, if it was just the alignment of these planets and whatnot, everybody would have seen it and said, oh, that's what that means. They're like troubled. What are you talking about? What star? This is ridiculous. These scientists, this is an attack on our faith. Thus, it seems to have required faith to see the star. And it still does today, obviously, require faith. From all these considerations, and from some of the greatest doctors like Chrysostom and Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, it is clear that the star was miraculous and fittingly so. It was to manifest none other than the birth of our Savior, the birth of the Son of God into this world through Mary. Anything less, anything less would have seemed to be outdone by the pillar of fire and other phenomena in the history of our salvation.
No wonder then, for this day, the church gives us in the breviary the saying of St. Gregory the Great. He says, all the elements bore witness that their creator had come. Let me describe their witness in anthropomorphic terms. The heavens straightway sent a star to show that they knew it was God. The sea knew and made itself solid as a roadway beneath his feet. The earth knew it quaked at his death. The sun then also knew and withdrew its radiant light. Rocks split and walls fell when he died to show that they too knew. Hell itself acknowledged him when it gave back the dead it had been holding. All inanimate creation sensed that this was indeed its Lord. Yet the hearts of the unbelieving Jews still do not acknowledge him as God. Harder than stone, they will not let themselves be rent in repentance. Thank you, St. Gregory. Seems to me the unbelieving Jews are not the only ones with hearts of stone. Science has hardened our hearts by trying to make faith its subordinate. That we can only believe something when they check it out. Let us not be hard of heart but believe. The star of Bethlehem was miraculous. It was new, never seen before, and it will never be seen again. It was for a purpose, and it has been accomplished. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.